All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, real quick, as we are coming in, um, we are going to ask for everyone to please keep their videos off, uh, as well as your microphones muted. Uh, so that'll help our program run as smoothly as possible. Um, and we're going to be getting started in uh, a few minutes, about 7.05, um, to, give, to give everyone a chance to... Uh, to uh, make their way in, but uh, but yeah, thank you all so much. I'm Andrew, by the way. All right, good to see all the turnout. I'm Mike. I'm going to be joining Andrew. We're going to be talking about the planet Mars here tonight. So thank you for joining us. And as Andrew said, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. We're going to be using the chat to communicate with us if you have questions or comments. So as you're waiting, why don't you uh, go into the chat and you're gonna be addressing your questions to Andrew. And we're wondering what your favorite planet is. Now, we're hoping you're gonna say Mars, but we understand <laughs> if you like Saturn or Pluto more instead. But if you wanted to let us, let Andrew know, Andrew uh, LSC questions know what your favorite planet is. We'll get used to also by doing that and using the chat as a way to ask questions. And, uh, and in fact, depending on where you live right now, you might be able to actually look out your window, or depending on the weather, you might be able to actually look out your window and see Mars right now. It's pretty cool. So if you've got a window that can see toward the east, and you see a really bright reddish-orange dot of light, that's Mars. This is the best appearance of Mars in about two years, and all the rest of November, it's going to still be very bright in our skies. It's going to be with us all the way until July of next year, but the real peak of its brightness is right, right about now. And we'll talk about why that is, why Mars is so bright. No other cha planet changes in brightness as dramatically as the red planet Mars does. Okay, we at least have one vote for Mars as a favorite planet. Me too. We're just saying before uh, talking with Jessica here from the library before the show began that there's a lot been a lot of books and other and films about Mars and I think a lot of folks like me were inspired about got interested in Mars by reading books about Mars like War of the Worlds which we'll talk about in our program a story about Martian invaders from 1897 so written long ago but uh, was also uh, been remade recently fairly recently as a movie by Steven Spielberg. So, so, Mike, I am seeing from uh, Audrey uh, that they like Mars and Earth the best, uh, and from and from Aiden that, that that they also like Mars the best. Um, which I agree. I'm a big Mars fan myself. Yeah, during the show we'll talk big about it. It, it. It's interesting that Mars in a telescope is not very interesting unless you have a large telescope, and yet there are things about Mars that really got us interested in, in Mars, and it's the only planet we really have thought about as being a potential place that might have life beyond Earth. And we'll talk about a little bit why that is, why we thought that there actually might be life on Mars. We know now that there is no intelligent life on Mars, but maybe right. it got going long ago, at least maybe in, in small form, in microscopic form, for example. Yeah, uh, so, so Mike, I'm also hearing from Theo, uh, that their favorite planet is Uranus. I think a very underrated planet. I love Uranus. <laughs> uh, and uh, Harsh is letting us know that Mars is their second favorite planet. So close enough, right? Well, <laughs> the uh, planet we'll Uranus. I had someone, I was doing shows over the weekend, and we had someone in the audience who was very interested in Uranus and asked me to talk about the fact that right now the planet Uranus is in opposition, which means it comes up at sunset, is overhead at midnight, and sets at sunrise. And although they didn't discover Uranus until 1781 with a telescope, if you know exactly where to look, you can actually see Uranus with your unaided eye. But no one noticed it until 1781, until uh, when, when, I tell it, when, when Herschel discovered it through a telescope. But you're right, I think Uranus doesn't get 
the respect it deserves as yeah. the first planet ever discovered with a telescope. And, uh, uh, and, and as, uh, as Theo mentioned, the, the only planet to be tipped over on its side. Yeah. Um, yeah instead of being like this, it's like that. Yeah. 90, 90, 93, 97 degree uh, tilt. I can never remember the exact yeah, number. Something like that. Yeah, 97. Not important. Yeah. Not yeah. important. <laughs> What's important is that it's tipped. Yeah. All right, so it, I'm seeing now it is 705, 706. So Mike, if, you, if you'd like, we can go ahead and get started. Yes, yeah, so let's uh, turn things over to uh, our host, first of all, Jess Schneider, who was kind enough to invite us to come and give this presentation today. Over to you, Jess. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome, you know, me from the library, or at least I hope you do. Um, just want to thank the Liberty Science Center, the Planetarium, and Mike and Andrew for doing this presentation for us. We are recording it, so we'll post it to our YouTube page later on if you want to watch again um, or share it with your friends. That could be fun. And if you guys have any library questions, you can also, you know, send me an email or put it in the chat. Maybe <laughs> Andrew will send it my way. Um, yeah, check, make sure to check our calendar and our newsletter for a lot of other fun stuff coming up in November and December. And I hope to see you at the library. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you, Jess. And so uh, welcome again. I'm Mike, and this is Andrew, who is also with the Planetarium at Liberty Science Center. So normally, Andrew and I work in this big dome, the biggest planetarium in the entire Western Hemisphere, 90 feet in diameter, a place where you can sit and watch the nighttime sky. But tonight, we're going to be taking the same software we use in our planetarium, which is called Digistar. We're going to use it on your home screens to bring the nighttime sky to you. And we're gonna focus on exploring that planet Mars that has fascinated us for such a long time. So uh, during the program, I will give the program using our visuals and we'll also leave time throughout the show to respond to the questions that you have in the chat. So I'm gonna pass things off to Andrew for a moment to talk about how the chat and how that can be your way of asking your questions that you have uh, to us about astronomy and about Mars in particular. All right, sounds good. So, so yeah, uh, so thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jess. And for everyone uh, who is joining us uh, uh, tonight, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, so I will be handling uh, questions today. Mike will be busy presenting and won't be able to pay attention to chat very well. Uh, so that is what I'll be doing. So if you have any questions, any comments, if you see something you think is really cool, um, or if you've got a fun Mars fact you, you, you'd like to share with everyone, um, you can write me a message in the chat. Um, my name is LSC Questions Andrew. So any questions you have, any, anything you'd like to share, you can uh, let me know. Um, and uh, as Mike said, we'll take some breaks during the show to answer questions. We'll also spend um, at least five minutes after the show is over um, to answer more of your questions then. And Mike, I'm actually seeing one question right now. Uh, Dylan wants to know, um, when can humans walk on Mars? Which is a really, really good Great question. question. Yeah. We don't know. Uh, we're hoping sometime soon, sometime the next, I say soon, sometime the next 20, maybe 30 years is kind of where technology is looking right now, um, which will be right around the time when many of you will be the age to be astronauts. So maybe, maybe some of you will be the first people to walk around on Mars. Be pretty cool. Be pretty cool. Um, but Mike, uh, that's all from me for now. Uh, so Great. we can uh, go ahead and begin. All right, let's get going. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And Andrew, can you verify that you can see my screen? Looks wonderful. Great. So we're going to start out where all astronomy has its beginnings. We're going to look at the nighttime sky. And in fact, we're going to look at the actual sky you're going to see this very evening. So as you probably know, we got off of daylight saving time recently, which means the sun goes down really early, like around five o'clock or so. So here we are today. So it's Thursday, November 5, 2020. Here it is, 348 in the afternoon. And here is the sun already just about to set. So we're going to go out a little bit later and look at the western sky. First of all, Mars is not the only planet that is out tonight. We have a great autumn 
to view for viewing the planets. We're going to point out the other planets as well, the, the sister planets, as it were, of Mars. But let's go ahead and go out to about 615 tonight. So we got to wait for the sun to set and a little bit after sunset before it gets dark enough to see the other things in the sky. So we're going to go ahead and uh, head on out. So the sun is so bright that it it does take about an hour or so after sunset for the stars and for that matter, the planets to emerge. And so we're going to stop here about 6.50. So for most of the beginning of the show, we're going to show you the sky around 6.15. But we're also going to show you where Mars is later in the, in the, in the evening, because right now, uh, 616 is already passed, so we'll show you also where it will be like at 10 o'clock tonight. Be aware, Mars is going to be with us all the way till July, and we're supposed to have really great weather for the next five days. So your chances of seeing Mars, if not tonight, are still excellent tomorrow night and throughout the weekend. So as we're looking towards the western sky tonight at 615, the same direction where the sun went down. So the first thing you're going to notice as you look towards the west is a very bright planet. This is not Mars. Mars is back behind us over in the east. Instead, it is a planet that normally is always the second brightest planet in the sky. It's the planet Jupiter. Now, if you have even a moderate telescope, the planet Jupiter reveals its banding. It's a giant ball of gas, basically. And it also has four really large moons called the Galilean moons of Jupiter because they were discovered by Galileo when he invented the telescope. In uh, around 1609, he invented it. 1610, he discovered the four large moons of Jupiter, which to this day are called the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Actually, Jupiter does have 79 known moons. So these outer planets, big balls of gas, are both much larger than Mars and the Earth and have many, many more moons. And that is also true of the planet that's right next to the planet Jupiter. So if we look out to our sky, look at Jupiter, and then look just above Jupiter, there's another pretty bright light, not as bright as Jupiter, but still quite bright. And in a telescope, there is no planet more beautiful than the planet Saturn. The rings of Saturn that at no point touch the planet are the most lovely thing that you'll ever see in a telescope. So both these planets are going to be with us in the western sky all the way until the end of December. So planets move to their own drummer. They don't come back at the same time as the stars do. But as good luck would have it, we got some really bright planets all the way till the end of 2020, including both Jupiter, the bright one, and Saturn, a little dimmer, these two will be with us until the end of December, so two more months, and they'll also draw close to each other. So close together by the end of December, they'll seem like a single bright light in the sky. So although Mars is our focus, it's a really great time, a really great autumn all the way through for the planets. So let's take a break here and see if you have questions about uh, I, these planets or anything else before we move on to the northern sky. So Mike, uh, right now, uh, the only questions I'm seeing are things that, uh, that I know you'll be getting to later, except for one, um, which is, what is the coldest temperature on Mars and what is the hottest temperature on Mars? Um, so Mars is a really, really, um, it's a very varied planet. So during, during like winter on the poles, Mars gets down to like minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit, like minus 200. But during summer on the equator, it can get up to like 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but on average, it's like minus 80 Fahrenheit. But it can get pretty warm, right? 70 degrees is a nice, nice warm day, but it can also get down to minus 200, um, which is uh, pretty chilly to say the least. Yeah, um, very thin atmosphere on Mars, the temperature changes are really dramatic. Unlike Venus, where there's a really thick atmosphere and it stays one temperature. Right. 860 degrees Fahrenheit all the time on Venus. Right. So uh, I'm also seeing a couple questions now uh, come in about, uh, about seeing the planets. Um, so uh, 
so, so Ken wants to know if we can see the planets um, with a telescope, even, even with a lot of light pollution. Um, and thankfully, yes, um, Jupiter certainly, and Mars as well, are plenty bright enough to even just be seen with your, with your eyes, um, even, uh, even with a lot of, uh, of light pollution. They're, they're that bright. Um, your biggest challenge with Jupiter is going to be anything blocking your view of the horizon, because it's kind of low in the sky. Um, but, but light pollution shouldn't be, uh, sh uh, shouldn't be a problem where I live. I have a lot of light pollution. I'm in West New York, New Jersey, a lot of light pollution. Um, I saw Jupiter, uh, two nights ago, three nights ago, some point recently. Um, so it is definitely possible. Um, and, and Audrey wanted to know, will we see Jupiter and, and Saturn today? Um, and, uh, yeah, in fact, if you, if you have a window, that's, that's facing toward the south or southwest, you might be able to even see them right now. But you'll be able to see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars every night um, through about Jupiter and Saturn through the end of the year, Mars for about the next nine months. So lots of chances to see them in the sky if you can't see them tonight. And then Jupiter and Saturn are going to set tonight around just around nine o'clock, 930 or so. So you'll have a little bit of time if you look, look out after this program's over look over about eight o'clock or so towards the west, try to find the really, really bright one, brighter than any star in the sky over in the west is gonna be Jupiter. Yep. All right, Mike, so those are all the questions that I see right now. Okay, great. That was us looking towards the western sky. We're now gonna look around towards the north because uh, we always get questions about where the Big Dipper is and how to find the North Star. So we try to include a little bit of that into every program that we do. So we're looking towards the north. The famous starry pattern called the Big Dipper is always in the sky in New Jersey. It never sets. So as long as it's clear and dark, you can always find it in New Jersey. So let's just give you a moment here, look towards the north and see if you can find the Big Dipper. I'll give you a hint. Although it never sets in New Jersey, every November it gets as low as it ever gets in the evening sky. If you want to let Andrew know in the chat, if you see it, you can just say, I see it if you do see the Big Dipper. Andrew, do we have anyone saying that they have picked that out? Uh, yes, Mike, we definitely do. Um, so uh, Patrick, Joey, uh, Patrick, Zoe, excuse me, and, and Jonah uh, all see it in in the sky. Great. All right, so here is the cup of the Big Dipper, these four stars, and the handle. Now a funny thing about the Big Dipper is that these stars are not very bright. They're what's called second magnitude, which are just the kind of bright stars. But that shape is so distinctive that it's really easy to find the Big Dipper in the sky, even though the stars aren't that bright. You can connect the dot, turn it into, a dipper is like a spoon. We don't use it much these days, I guess. Now the Big Dipper also is important because it shows you how to find the North Star. Now most of us have GPS on our cell phones now, but hey, if it ever goes out and you're trying to find your directions, the Big Dipper, the two stars in the cup that don't have the handle attached, will point you right to the North Star the only star that doesn't move, the North Star stays here in the north and all of the stars move around it. Before I moved to New Jersey, I lived in Hawaii. And in Hawaii, the name for the North Star is Hokupa'a, which means the stuck star. Because again, it's the one star that doesn't move. Now you may have heard the North Star is the brightest star, but it's actually only the 49th brightest star in the sky. And so it really is nice to have a guide like the Big Dipper to help you find your road to the North Star. The North Star is the last star in the Little Dipper, which is kind of a junior version of the Big Dipper. The two dippers pour into each other. Here we have the, the Little Dipper. Now, these are both terms that are not found around the world. The term Big Dipper, for example, comes from North America. A very similar term is the Drinking Gourd a term for the Big Dipper that was used by escaped slaves before the Civil War because the Big Dipper showed them the road to the North Star. It showed them the direction north towards the states where slavery was illegal. 
Now over in England, where I lived for two years, they call it the plow, like a farmer uses. They call it King David's chariot in Ireland. Everyone has a different name for the starry patterns that matter to them the most. Now, it got really hard for astronomers around the world to commu communicate with each other if every one of them had a different name for the constellations. So in 1922, the International Astronomical Union agreed on 88 official names, 88 official constellations. So a Big Bear is the official name of the Big Dipper and Little Bear is the official name of the Little Dipper. The names go back about 2,500 years, but the official assigning of 88 constellations and assigning every piece of the sky to one or another of these 88 was only done back in 1922. But now the search is a map of the sky to allow astronomers to talk to each other. They saw a new star appear in the big bear. They all know what they're talking about. Now, another starry pattern that is not made of very bright stars, but pops out very nicely is one called Cassiopeia. It's like a backwards E and it's on exactly the opposite side of the North Star from where the Big Dipper is. And these two, and that can be a handy dandy thing to keep in mind if you get late in the evening tonight and if your Big Dipper goes down behind the trees. So we're gonna let night take its course. There again is the North Star. We're going to now seven o'clock, eight o'clock. The Dipper goes low and Cassiopeia gets high in the sky. And so here we go past a lot of our bedtimes probably here at two o'clock in the morning. But if you ever can't find the Big Dipper, if it's ever blocked off by, and you can't find these pointer stars aiming towards the North Star, if you take Cassiopeia, imagine it as a W, imagine these middle stars are like an arrow. They kind of point you, kind of point you to, to where the North Star is. And because the North Star is the only kind of bright star in that part of the sky, as long as you get close, then that'll be enough to figure out where the North Star is located. So why is it that the one star, the North Star stays in place and everything spins around it? Well, the North Star is over the North Pole, the axis of our rotation. We point to it and as the world turns, it stays right over the North Pole and points out where North is all the way through the night. So very, very, very helpful for finding directions. Again, nowadays, most of us do have compasses on our smartphones, but it's still really good to know that you can use the stars to find directions. See if there's any questions here, Andrew, before we actually move on to the star of our show, which of course is a planet. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, so um, uh, I see a couple questions, but uh, I'm gonna save them for a little bit later on in the program. Okay. Um, because I know you'll you'll be answering at least a couple of them. Oh, well, one question that just came up. Uh, so uh, so Harsh wants to know if there is a South Star, um, and there is not a South Star. There's not like one individual star that points exactly south, um, but there is a group of stars that you can use to find south uh, called the the uh, Southern Cross. Um, so there's not a star, but there is a group of stars you can use to find south. Um, and um, uh, Jonah wanted to know, uh, when, did, when did we find the North Star? So that's a really good question. Um, people have kind of always seen the North Star. Um, so it wasn't a thing that was necessarily found, but I don't know when people realized that it that it was um like that that it was the north star that it didn't move i don't i'm, I'm not sure mike i don't know if, if you have anything to add to that yeah it's a great question part of it is that although north star right now stays in place the earth wobbles very slowly taking twenty six thousand years to do a wobble which means that it's, the North Star has only been a really good North Star for only about a thousand years. So gradually, I would say like around the year 750, they begin to notice, hey, that one star is really close to where true North is. Right. And the wobble was such that by a thousand AD, it was in a really good position to clearly mark off where North is. Neat. Um, uh, so a couple, couple of questions uh, that I've, I've 
just come in um, that we'll run through real quick. So Dylan wanted to know, how can we tell uh, which is which planet? That's a really, really good question and it's kind of hard to do normally. Um, but now um, in the evening sky, um, you can tell uh, Mars or you can tell Jupiter and Saturn uh, apart because they're two bright things close to each other. But Jupiter is way brighter than Saturn. Um, which is just because Saturn is way further away from us. That's why it looks dimmer. Um, and then Mars, you can tell because Mars is kind of a, a really, really bright orangish red color. Um, so that's how you can tell the planets apart. Now you can tell a planet is a planet from a star because planets don't twinkle like stars do. Um, so that's one way to tell a planet from a star. Um, but yeah, Mike, those are all the questions that, uh, that, uh, I'm seeing right now that we're going to answer. Uh, if you got more, keep sending them in, but, uh, let's, let's keep on moving. Great. So yeah, that's, uh, enough of the prelude. Let's get to Mars itself. So here we are looking towards the East. Now we haven't changed the time. So it's still what you would see at 6, 6 15 tonight, which is when it gets fully dark here in November. And so if you're out just after six, looking towards the East, so the brightest thing you're going to see in the eastern sky right now, and it has a distinct but very slight orange color, is in fact the planet Mars. Mars is much brighter right now than it normally is. It's almost the same brightness as Jupiter. So it's actually really kind of cool to go out, look towards the west, and find the really bright dot of Jupiter, which has kind of a white color to it, and look towards the east here and look for the slight orange and almost equally bright dot that is the planet Mars. So things rise in the east. So Mars is just coming up as you go and find it here as it fully gets dark. And it's going to be with us all night long. So unlike Jupiter and Saturn that are going to go away around 9 o'clock or so tonight, Mars is going to be with us the entire evening. If you're an early riser, you can even catch it before the first light of dawn in the morning sky. So let's have a look first of all at the progress that Mars will make across the sky. So Mars blazing away brighter than any star at minus two magnitude, which just means really, really, really bright, the same brightness roughly as Jupiter right now. And as the evening goes on, so here it is at six o'clock in the evening. And we're going to go now, first of all, to about 930. So as the world turns, Mars gets higher and higher. And about 930 tonight, it'll be in the south. So then we can turn around and face towards the south to check out where Mars will be around 930. So when Mars is due south, it's gonna be just a little over halfway up in the sky. And as the morning goes on, as we go into the early hours, Mars will get lower and lower and will set just before the first light of day. So again, overhead, almost the entire evening. Makes it a lot easier to try to spot it if you have kind of mixed weather. Now I should mention that as Mars sets in the morning sky here in November, if you look over like about four o'clock in the morning towards the eastern sky, the only planet that outshines every other dot in the sky, the planet Venus, will be coming up just before the first light of day. So Venus is minus 397, so basically minus four magnitude, which means it's about six times brighter than Mars is. So if you look towards the east in the morning sky, and this will be true also till the end of the year, the really, really bright dot just before daybreak is the planet Venus. And although Mars is really, really bright right now, it still literally can't hold a candle to Venus. Nothing is brighter than Venus except for the sun and the moon. So you can actually, though, if you have a flat horizon, play your cards right about 4 o'clock in the morning, tomorrow morning and for the rest of November, you can catch Mars sinking into the west right as Venus is rising. So both nighttime and just before daybreak, you get lots of stuff, lots of great stuff to see. As a bonus, also if you're up early in the morning, this again is four o'clock in the morning, just before daylight, here in November, you can also see what are called the winter constellations already on parade. So the famous hero Orion with its brilliant stars. Orion facing off against Taurus the bull. So a couple of things to mention here is, okay, here we have Mars, the actual planet Mars in the west. Some stars 
have the same red color as Mars, or I should say the same orange color. And sometimes people confuse these reddish stars with Mars. It's easy not to avoid confusing them right now because Mars is brighter than any of the ready stars in the sky. But the shoulder of Orion, a star called Betelgeuse, which you may know from giving its name to a movie character, has a slight red color to it. And so does Aldebaran, the bright star that makes the eye of the bull. So there are a number of red stars in the sky that can be mistaken for Mars, but it's easy right now because all the other stars are nowhere near as bright as the planet Mars. Now I mentioned that uh, Mars and Jupiter and Venus outshine every star in the sky. In case you're wondering what is the brightest star, well besides our sun, of course, the brightest star is called Sirius, S-A-R-I-U-S, uh, and it's still a couple of times dimmer than Mars is. Sirius, its name means scorching in Greek and is brilliant the bright star in the dog, big dog, Canis Major, called the dog star for that reason. There's also the little dog is in the sky, Canis Minor. The Gemini Twins, which is where the moon is tonight. And also Ariga, the charioteer. For some reason, he's a guy driving a chariot holding baby goats. All of those are on parade in the morning sky as well. So lots of stuff to see, uh, but focusing on Mars again, shining at minus two magnitude, Mars is still going to be outshining everything in the sky except for the planet Venus. So great viewing at night, great viewing in the morning as well. Now before we talk more about Mars and our long fascination with Mars, let's see if there are any questions before we head out and talk about Mars, God of War. <laughs> um, so one question I'm seeing right now uh, is, is how did people realize that the stars made shapes? Um, which is a really, really interesting question. Or, or, or how is it that the stars kind of make stuff? Um, I think that comes a lot down to just what we like to do as people, right? We as human beings like to see patterns and shapes and things, right? When we look up at the sky, uh, when it's a cloudy day, right? Uh, I, I, I like to imagine shapes in the clouds. Um, so people just like to make, people just like to make shapes, right? People like to see patterns and stuff, which is pretty cool. So we do the same thing with the stars and we, we've been doing it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years at this point. And Mike, the, uh, the other questions I see, I know we're going to answer later. So we Great. can, we, we keep on going. Great. Okay. So yes, here are some of the famous shapes in the sky, in the morning sky right now mainly names that came from the Greeks and Romans. And so the idea of Mars being a god of war also came from the Greeks and the Romans. Now, if you've ever taken out a book on mythology, you may know that the Greeks had a different name for Mars. They called him Ares, A-R-E-S. And to the Greeks, Ares was kind of a joke. He was always getting in trouble. He was a bit of a fool. But the Romans, who borrowed a lot of things from the Greeks, turned Mars into their most important god. He was a god of war. And the Romans were a very martial people. The word martial, of course, comes from Mars as well, such as in the word martial arts. And in fact, the Romans thought so much of Mars that the first month in the Roman calendar is named after the god Mars. So March derives its name from the god Mars, the original Roman calendar began with March. Now, if you know that September, October, November, and December means seven month, eight month, nine month, and 10 month, that only makes sense if you begin your year in March, as the Romans originally did. And so they really thought quite highly of him. This is a, uh, the Palatine Museum, just beside the Roman Forum. It's amazing, very powerful statue of Mars as God of War. That idea continued uh, throughout the Middle Ages and to modern times that Mars meant warfare. One of the lesser known Shakespeare plays is called Henry VI. In Henry VI part one, the King of France says that one's fortunes in war are as unpredictable as the appearance of Mars. So here we are in the War of the Roses, which was uh, what that play is all about. And there's the god Mars with kind of a smile on his face, looking down as two armies clash during a battle here in the Middle Ages. 
So the idea that Mars meant warfare was going to probably be one of the reasons why we often envision science fiction Martians as being aggressive as well. But understanding Mars itself was a challenge. This idea that Mars, its very appearance was hard to understand. No other planet changes in brightness, for example, the way that Mars does. Sometimes Mars is no brighter than any of the stars in the Big Dipper down to second magnitude. And other times like right now, it's blazingly bright. And that really mystified people. The very motion of Mars mystified people. So nowadays, it's not really a mystery. It's that Mars is a little world, half the size of Earth. So it doesn't reflect a lot of light. It's only 4,000 miles in diameter, not that much wider than the United States. So here is where things were a year ago, November 2019. There is Earth nearer to the sun than Mars. Here is Mars. And Mars was so far away, 230 million miles a year ago, that it was a very faint little orangey dot in the sky. Again, no brighter than the stars in the Big Dipper. And so that's how feeble Mars appeared when it was that far away. But as all of 2020 unfolded, as we were busy with many other things, the planet Earth on the inside path here was catching up with the planet Mars. And throughout 2020, we were getting closer and closer to Mars and it was getting brighter and brighter in the sky. Until eventually, as we get into October and November, it winds up only being about 40 million miles away instead of 230 million miles away. So Mars gets way, way closer and being way closer like it is right now, it shines much, much more brightly in the skies. And no other planet has anything like that change in brightness that is unique to Mars. And it's one of the things that really intrigued astronomers is to try to figure out why. Well, that's why the difference between the two planets changes so dramatically. And so this is uh, how we are just about now with Mars uh, almost at peak brightness. It peaked in October, but it's still really, really bright here in November. And you'll have no problem finding it throughout November. But a lot of understanding Mars had to do with trying to figure out what was Mars like through the eyepiece of a telescope. And that was both fascinating and frustrating because Mars is really a small target in a telescope. Uh, before we go on to the telescopic views of Mars, let's see if we have any questions. Looks like Anavin may be raising a hand. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, you can send them to me through the chat. Uh, that's the way we're handling all of our questions today, just because there's so many of us. Um, so if you have any questions, you can send them to me uh, in, uh, in the chat. Um, so right now, um, the only question I'm seeing that's gone unanswered so far is, uh, is whether or not Mars has, uh, has a blue sunset. Um, and yes, if you were on the surface of Mars watching the sun go down, it would look kind of bluish. Um, during the daytime, when the sun's up high in the sky, um, the sky would look more of like a, like a reddish pink color. So very different than what we're used to here on the Earth. That all comes down to what the atmosphere is made of. It's made of different stuff than the Earth's atmosphere is. But I think that's all the questions we have for now, Mike, uh, so we can keep on going. All right, well, onto the telescope age. So Galileo, as I mentioned earlier, invented the telescope in 1609 in Italy. And he very quickly turned his telescope on Jupiter and discovered that Jupiter had four moons that no one knew existed until then. And he looked at the moon and lo and behold, saw the moon had mountains and craters. The moon was a whole separate world. And so having made these great discoveries in September of 1610, he turned his telescope on Mars, expecting wonders. But all he saw was a little tiny fuzzy red ball in the telescope. He really couldn't see anything on Mars and was disappointed uh, compared to all the amazing things he had seen in some of the other objects in the solar system. So Galileo's telescope was not highly advanced. He made it himself. And we had to wait for better telescopes a little bit later in the 17th century before Mars began to reveal its secrets. So in 
1659, this man, a Dutch astronomer, Christian Huygens, was the first person using a newfangled, highly advanced telescope for the time to see a feature on Mars. It looks like a giant heart. It's a plane, a plane on Mars, a dark rolling plane that uh, is called Certus Major. And this was important because once you see any feature on Mars, you can track how long it takes to go around and figure out how long a day on Mars is. And he figured out a day on Mars is about the same as a day on Earth. In fact, Mars has a day that's only 37 minutes longer than Earth Day, very similar to a, a day here on Earth. A few years later, in uh, 1666, another astronomer of his time named uh, Giovanni Cassini discovered the polar caps on Mars. So Mars was starting to look a little bit like Earth. It had polar caps that changed with the seasons. It seemed like Mars did have seasons. And it had a day as long as a day on Earth. So some things about Mars were definitely Earth-like. But it remained a challenge because, again, you're looking at a tiny planet through the thick atmosphere of Earth and trying to make sense out of what you're seeing. So one astronomer who dedicated his life to pursuing Mars was Percival Lowell. In the late 19th century, he became very smitten with studying the planet Mars. Lowell, now, I know that astronomers nowadays do most of their work sitting in a t-shirt and blue jeans at a computer using a telescope thousands of miles away. But even for me, the idea of an astronomer in my mind is this picture of Percival Lowell at his telescope in a three-piece suit looking through the eyepiece. So Lowell, he uh, came from, Lowell, from Boston, Massachusetts. His family was very rich. The town of Lowell, Massachusetts is named after his family. He became very smitten with Mars in 1893 when someone gave him a book about Mars as a Christmas present. And within a few months, he went, had built an observatory in what was then Arizona Territory and spent night after night after night observing Mars in his telescope. Now he didn't use photographs because he was waiting for the little moments of clear seeing where the air on Earth gets still enough to see fine detail. In a photograph, you can't really capture that because a long exposure photograph mixes in the clear seeing and the fuzzy times. So he sat there and would sketch what he saw on Mars when the weather got nice and clear and still. And here is what he saw, a very different Mars and for example, Christian Huygens saw earlier. Lowell saw 437 canals on Mars. And he didn't mince words. He believed these were canals dug by water-hungry Martians. He believed that Mars was drying out. That is why Mars had a sandy color to it. And that literally the only water left on Mars was at the polar caps. So in Lowell's view, the Martians, being highly advanced, built these canals to bring water from the polar caps to the great central cities near the equator of Mars. Now, oddly enough, Lowell believed that Martians had to be peaceful. His argument was that none of these canals went around or bent around national boundaries. They were just straight as they possibly could be. So he believed the Martians had banded together in their hour of desperation to build these massive canals. But still, if you Imagine Mars as being a place that would have intelligent life and imagine that Martians were desperate for water. And if you think of 2000 years of tradition of Mars signifying aggression and warfare, it's not hard to imagine a different kind of Martian than the peaceful Martians that Percival Lowell thought about. So a few years later, we got a very different idea of what Martians might be like. It's a novel called War of the Worlds. It was first published in 1897. And in it, the author, H.G. Wells, has Martians come to Earth, but they're not the peaceful Martians of Percival Lowell. Now, at first, the Martians can't get around very well. Lowell had talked a lot about the gravity of Mars and Mars having low gravity. So H.G. Wells knew that Mars had low gravity. So he figured Martians would have a hard time getting around on Earth. So at first, when the Martians land outside of London, the Earthlings think they're safe because the Martians can barely move in the heavy gravity of Earth. But then these three-legged war machines rise up. 
with their heat rays. Now they're not lasers because in 1897, we didn't have lasers, but they have heat rays. Everything the human race throws at the Martians can't stop these war machines. And it looks like the end is nigh for the human race. What stops the Martians is not anything that the earthly armies could throw at them. The Martians had never been exposed to earthly bacteria. So they all catch the common cold basically, and they are stopped that way. So a very influential novel and gave us the idea for the first time of aggressive warlike Martians that became a regular staple in science fiction for another 75 years after that. And led to one of the most famous moments in the history of radio when 40 years later, a completely different Wells, who is not related to, or to H.G. Wells, a man named Orson Wells, was doing a radio show in New York called Mercury Theater on the Air. And they were doing this in 1938. They would every Sunday night take a novel, usually a novel, and turn it into a radio drama. The first show they did is the famous horror story, Dracula. For the 17th one of their shows, they decided to update War of the Worlds. Now, Orson Welles was an actor and producer for the show. He would become a famous movie director three years later. And he was afraid that his audience on the radio would be bored by using this old novel from 40 years before. So he decided to do War of the Worlds as a modern story, doing a series of radio broadcasts saying that Martians had landed in Grover Mill, New Jersey, and we're taking over America from there. Of the six million people who heard that broadcast, one million believed that New Jersey was being invaded on October 30, 1938 by Martians. Now, if Orson Welles' show had talked about invaders from Venus, I doubt if there had been a panic, but this idea that Mars means aggression and warfare is so profound that we kind of expect Martians to be invaders. So in Grover Mill itself, the alleged landing uh, site, some uh, people grabbed their shotguns, according to rumor, and tried to go out and find these Martian war machines they'd heard about on the radio. So they thought they saw a war machine, fired their guns at it, and destroyed their town's water tower. That was the impact of Mars on our imagination. Just a little radio play about Martian invaders had folks panicking in the streets. Now, fortunately, nobody was hurt in the panic. And instead of ruining Orson Welles' career, Hollywood came knocking and he made a film called Citizen Kane, which is many regards still as the greatest American film of all time. Made the movie three years after the radio panic. So Mars has stayed with us. Many folks, I think, who got involved in sending missions to Mars were inspired by stories like this, by science fiction ideas, and by the work of early astronomers like, like, like Percival Lowell. Well, now we've gone to Mars a lot, and we know more about Mars because we've sent more robots to Mars than to any other planet in our solar system. Now, before we move on to seeing the real Mars as we know it today, Andrew, are there questions that you would like to address? Uh, so Mike, I'm seeing that, that we're running a little bit uh, short on time here. So uh, I'm gonna keep answering questions uh, uh, through, through the chat, um, but uh, I think we'll save the rest of them for the very end. That sounds great. Okay, so Mars. So here is Mars as we know it to really be from the robots that we've sent there. Mars does have two moons, which is something that neither Mercury nor Venus have at all. And of course, Earth just has one. These are captured asteroids going back to the idea of Mars being the war god, they're called Phobos and Deimos, fear and terror. Mars does have polar caps, as was observed way back in 1666. The air on Mars is really thin, 100 times as thin as the air on Earth, but there is enough air there for dust storms, like these dust devils you see, and sometimes dust storms that wrap the entire planet in dust. Two years ago, when Mars was, the last time Mars was close, the entire planet was blocked out by a dust storm during the closest appearance of Mars in uh, 2018. As Andrew was saying at the start of the show, it's mainly really cold on Mars. 200 below is the, 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 the coldest it gets. 
70 degrees as is the all-time high, like a, like a really pleasant spring day in New Jersey. Now, Mars is a fascinating world for giant features. It has massive extinct volcanoes and giant chasms. So there are no actual canals on Mars. So Lowell was seeing an optical illusion. When, it, when the eye tries to make sense of distant objects, you sometimes think they're straight lines when there's just kind of a random set of features. But Mars does have one giant chasm. The Grand Canyon of Mars here, 3,000 miles long and four miles deep, is a real chasm on Mars, but there's no canals dug by water-hungry Martians as have been envisioned by, by Mr. Lowell. Now, Mars is little. We talked about that before. It's only half the size of Earth and has only 11% of, of the weight or mass of Earth. And without a lot of gravity, Mars couldn't hold on to a thick atmosphere. And without a thick atmosphere, Mars couldn't hold on to its water. So that's led this world to be a totally different world than its neighbor, planet Earth. Uh, so much has, has changed in Mars because of the fact that it's smaller. Now, Mars is tilted, much like Earth is. Uh, we mentioned Uranus, which is tilted 98 degrees. Earth and Mars are tilted around 25 degrees, and that means that they do have pronounced seasons. We uh, landed a spacecraft on Mars back in 2012 that's still functioning on Mars called Curiosity, and landed in a place called Gale Crater, and it's revealed that Mars has the right conditions for life in some ways. It has organic molecules. It had a lot of water billions of years ago when Mars was a wetter planet with a thicker atmosphere. So curiosity here has kind of led the groundwork to really suggest that the elements do exist on Mars to have allowed life to get going, at least in ancient times when Mars was a wetter planet. Now, the last mission we sent to Mars before the one that's going right now is called InSight which is measuring Mars for earthquakes. It's not a rover, it just bang, landed and was just stayed right there, but sent back beautiful pictures. Here's Mars as seen by the InSight mission that landed on Mars exactly two years ago this month. But now, as happens every time Mars draws close, it's time for the next mission to go to Mars. This one here is called Perseverance. Its name was chosen, chosen by a 13-year-old student in a contest that had 28,000 suggestions, uh, at Perseverance being a good uh, name for a mission carrying out a quest. Now, when the name was chosen, they didn't realize they were gonna have to launch Perseverance in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So on top of everything else, sending a rocket to Mars, never an easy proposition. They had to do this in the middle of the COVID crisis. So there's a plaque on board Perseverance honoring the medical profession, the first responders. Here is the surgeon staff, as it were, the medical staff. And here we see uh, Perseverance leaving from Florida and heading off to the planet Mars. So they loaded the craft up in, uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and then it launched on the 30th of July of this year. So all of this, again, had to happen under stressful conditions of the pandemic, the final loading and then the launch of the mission in July. So here they're tucking away the rover. It's not gonna see the light of day again until it gets to Mars. Uh, Delta launch on the 30th of July, the very first moment they could launch, they did. They had clear weather that morning in Florida and off it goes on a seven month flight to the planet Mars. So seven months is nothing. That's uh, if you launch when Mars is close, like it is right now, you can get to Mars really, really quickly compared to, say, the five years it takes to go to Jupiter with a robot mission. So perfect uh, launch, and it's now about halfway on its way to Mars. Uh, Perseverance is going to land on the 18th of February, and uh, it's going to go straight on in and land. It's not going to orbit and go down. It's a straight shot to the planet Mars. The place they chose, after a lot of consideration, they're going to land in a place called Jezero, crater. Jezero is a Slavic word meaning lake. They found a lake bed. It was an ancient lake when Mars was a wet world four billion years ago, and that's going to be the landing site. They figure a lake bed would be a really good place to find evidence of ancient life on Mars, if such evidence does exist. So we've found no 
proof that Mars has any kind of life or had any kind of life, but landing in a, in a lake bed with a, uh, a river flowing into the lake bed, that seems like a really good location to go and explore. So they're going to be landing there and looking for both whether Mars had elements that could have helped life get going, but they're also going to actually try to find evidence of microscopic ancient life itself. Now, why are we doing this? In part because we want to figure out if life could have got going anywhere else in our solar system. We've never found proof of life anywhere else, anywhere besides Earth. But Mars is still a candidate, not for life now so much, but maybe for developing life long ago when it was a wetter planet. And the other thing is that we want to go to Mars with a human mission, as we mentioned in the beginning of our program. And we need to learn a lot more about Mars before we can actually send a human mission to the Red Planet. So a lot of this work is to pave the road for the first human mission, which one hopes will happen within 20 years or so. So the landing is gonna happen on the 18th of February, three o'clock in the afternoon. The air on Mars is thin, but there is enough air that the probe would burn up if it didn't have a heat shield. So the heat shield here is gonna actually slow Perseverance as it's coming in, that's the first of several steps in slowing the craft and will also prevent the craft from burning up as it comes on in. Now at this point, the mission is going to be out of touch with Earth for about seven minutes. They call it the seven minutes of terror for the folks running the mission because the spacecraft has to basically land itself. Mars is so far away that even a signal from Earth would take 20 minutes to get there so it's going to have to handle the landing by itself as it's out of contact with Earth. Again, with thin atmosphere, things like parachutes still work. So a parachute will slow the descent some more as it's coming in to land. And then phase three will be jettisoning the periscope and using rockets to actually land on Mars. You can see the rover here tucked away, seeing the light of the day for the first time since it was tucked away for its launch in uh, at Kennedy Space Center. So the jets then come on and then the rover will be gently put down on the surface of Mars in Jezero Crater. And once the landing happens, then the cowling on top of, of the lander has to get out of the way so it doesn't come crashing down on top of its billion dollar lander. So in hopes this will all go according to plan, and we should know by 3.30 in the afternoon on the 18th of February if the landing was successful or not. So delicately lowering the spacecraft, the wheels go into place, and the cowling with the jets above it lands the rover and then gets out of the way. So Perseverance is modeled on the Curiosity mission, but has a different set of instruments. And it's going to be examining both Mars for having elements that would allow life to flourish, but it's also going to actually take samples from the Martian soil and store them on board. So this has never been done before. So the arm's gonna reach out and take coring samples of the Martian rock and soil and store them on board. Each one of the samples is about as, as, as big as, say, a piece of chalk or about as big as my finger. So it's going to collect these by drilling down to the Martian surface and then taking them back on board and storing them for maybe 10 years. Because here's the deal with this. We try to analyze bits of Mars on our rovers in the past, but you can do far better work if you can analyze this Martian soil in an earthly laboratory. So they're going to store us on board for 10 years, and then a whole nother mission about 10 years from now is going to land next to Perseverance, collect these samples, and take them back to Earth so we can examine them in a laboratory back home on Earth. It's going to be a joint uh, European Space Agency and NASA mission that will collect these samples. So a really intriguing idea to store these away in what is really the cleanest clean room ever assembled. Now, one more thing you may have heard about, this mission also will have the first helicopter for any other world. You got to have air for helicopters to work. Again, the air on Mars is thin, but there's enough of it 
that this helicopter will go maybe as far as a thousand feet away from the rover and be able to explore Mars, uh, the area around the rover. It can kind of scout out good places to go for the rover and places that are where the terrain is too rough and where you want to avoid it. And it's the first time we've done this, but there's other projects afoot to uh, have helicopters on other worlds as well. The thing is you have to have air for a helicopter to work. So you have to find places like the moon Titan around Saturn that has an atmosphere. And then this, this intriguing idea can be put into practice. So the first helicopter in a foreign world weighs about four pounds and most of the flights it'll do will be done in the first uh, month of the mission. So stay tuned to that. That landing is happening very shortly on the 18th of February, so just a few months from now. And stay tuned to Mars in the Sky tonight. But I wanted to mention, as we're wrapping up here, that Mars is going to hang on all the way until July 4 of next year. So Mars will get fainter and fainter as, it, as we pull away from it. But even here on July 4, 2021, if you go out at sunset as it's just getting dark, you can still catch now a very faint planet Mars, again, no brighter than the stars in the Big Dipper, shining away there before it then goes behind the sun. So we have, fortunately, a lot of time to see Mars still, but really November is the time to check it out because it's blazing bright. It'll drop three times in brightness as we get into December and will be very faint again by the time we lose it in, uh, in July. So that's a little about Mars, both finding it in the sky and, and why we are so intrigued. We hope someday that it will be the first home of the human race after planet Earth. And again, who knows, maybe someone here in our audience tonight will be on that first human mission to the red planet. So that's the end of our program. Let's go ahead and uh, see if we can take some more questions before we wrap our program up. Sounds good. So yeah, if you have any, any questions, you can send them in to me in the chat and we'll answer as many of them as we can in the next five or 10 minutes. Um, so one question I'm seeing right now coming from Dylan, who wants to know how long uh, can these rovers or, or the robots like InSight, how long can they stay on Mars without anything destroying it? And that's a really, really good question. Um, the rovers on Mars that we send are pretty resilient. Um, they'll be active for at least 10 or 15 years. Um, what has uh, previous rovers that we've sent um, have stopped working because their batteries have stopped working. Um, they haven't been able to recharge their batteries. Um, or one of the rovers that we sent a couple decades ago got stuck on Mars. Um, it, got, it, it got stuck in like a, like a sand trap essentially on Mars, couldn't get itself out, so it stopped working. So these, these rovers are really, really resilient. Um, Curiosity has been there for what, like seven years now? Eight, eight years. Almost eight, eight years. Eight, yeah, as of August. Yeah, yeah. so it's so, so been, there, been, been there for eight years. I would say that uh, if everything goes as planned, perseverance will, will be there for even longer. Um, so, so yeah, these are the rovers we're sending now are very resilient, um, and they're powered by a by a nuclear battery. So they don't need to see the sun like some of our earlier rovers did. So uh, they they'll be there for a pretty long time. Um. So uh, Audrey wants to know that, uh, who made the first rover. So the first Mars rover um, was made by NASA, if I'm correct about that. Um, but the first rover overall um, would have been one of the moon rovers. Mike, I don't know if, if you know what like the first rover was um, that humans built. Yeah, the, certainly the first Mars rover was uh, the Pathfinder Sojourner mission that had a little tiny rover it was 1997, right? That was about the size of a child's toy, but that was a real breakthrough to have a rover on Mars. Uh, and so we've also, I don't know that they had rovers that were robotic, but the last three Apollo missions had moon buggies. They were rovers that the astronauts actually drove. So that was 1970 and 1971 and 72. Mm -hmm. They had 
actual moon buggy, but those were actually, the astronauts sat in these and drove those rovers. So robotic rovers, uh, the first uh, one for Mars was Pathfinder in uh, 1997. Cool. Um, so uh, uh, Christina wanted to know, why do we take small samples, tiny samples, instead of big ones? Um, that's a really good question. That mostly comes down to two things. Um, first of all, the rovers themselves um, are built in such a way that they can only take small samples. Um, weight for a rover is really important to keep low so we can launch it successfully and land it successfully. So, so their instruments are usually kept pretty small. Um, but also with, with, with this mission, we're taking small samples because we want to be able to uh, take them back to the Earth. And it's much, much easier to get a small sample from Mars to the Earth than a big sample. Um, and we can learn um, really just as much from a small sample as we can a big sample. Because we're looking mostly at things like the chemical makeup of a rock. And that'll be the same whether you, you, you take a big, uh, whether you, you take a, a big sample or a small sample. Um, so mostly it just comes down to it's easier for us to deal with small samples rather than big samples. Um, so uh, Maria wants to know what happened to the water on Mars, which is a great question because it does not have a confirmed answer. Those are my favorite questions. Um, but we do have ideas, right? So for a planet to have water, it needs a couple of things, right? It needs to be warm enough for it to be uh, liquid, um, but not too warm for it to just evaporate. Um, so the temperature is important, but it also needs to have an atmosphere to create pressure to keep it as a liquid. So back in the day, three and a half billion years ago, Mars had an atmosphere. So it was the right temperature to have liquid water and it had enough pressure to keep the water as a liquid. Now to have an atmosphere, you need to have a magnetic field around the planet. Um, which helps protect it from radiation from the sun. Now, to have a magnetic field, you need to have a really hot molten core. So what we think happened to Mars is that the molten core of Mars cooled down. That led to it losing its magnetic field, which meant it lost its atmosphere, which meant it lost all the pressure on the surface, so a lot of the water evaporated was then blown out into space by solar radiation. Um, some of it ended up freezing um, because it was colder. And now Mars is like it is today. So it's a really complex system that can lead to a planet having water. I mean, we're really lucky that we have water on the Earth, right? Because a, a lot of things can go wrong with a planet to cause it to lose its water. So we're really lucky that we have water and our water's not going anywhere. Um, so, so it's a very, very, uh, very complex set of circumstances that led to Mars losing its water. Um, so Harsh wanted to know, can the rovers come back to the Earth? Um, unfortunately, uh, no, not, not the rovers we've sent so far. Um, in theory, we could send a rover to Mars and then bring it back. There isn't really a big reason to do that as of right now. Um, we're, we're able to get all the information we need without having to send something there to bring it back. Because um, it's, it's a really hard thing to do. Let me see. So another question, how many stars are there? That is a great question. Um, so in just, our, in just our galaxy, there's around 200 billion. Just our own galaxy. There are lots of other galaxies out there, about two trillion of them. Each of them have about a billion stars in them as well. So there is, I will say, an uncountable number of stars out there. Trillions upon trillions upon trillions, so many stars. I can't even give you a number because there's too many. There's not a number in the English language, I don't think, that I can give you. Maybe there is but I don't know it. Um, let me see. So uh, who discovered the first constellation? That's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say anyone discovered the first ones. 
like I don't know pretty much as long as there have been people we have made shapes in the sky which we can call constellations um the shapes that we see in the sky today um that that we identify as constellations those shapes go back um, many of them over 2,000 years ago. But as long as there have been people, we've drawn constellations in the sky. Um, so they, they've been around for a very, very long time. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Um, Bradley wants to know, can we see other galaxies with telescopes other than the Milky Way? Um, yes, we most certainly can. Using telescopes, like professional scientific telescopes, We've seen millions of other galaxies. With a telescope from your backyard, you could probably see, let's see, like Andromeda and 51, I'll say maybe 10 or 15 galaxies with just a telescope from your backyard, maybe probably even more than that. Um, but we've seen lots of galaxies with, with, uh, with, uh, with telescopes. Um, and, and, and then, and then like, uh, uh, Harsh wanted to know how, how are we going to get those samples back to the earth? So I'm like, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit about how we're going to get those samples from Mars back to the earth. Yes. That's, they're still working on that idea. The plan is to actually have a mission working with the Europeans to send a mission there that would land next to it and then be able to take off on Mars and return. Now, so that's much more complicated, right? It's, we've never had a mission, as we were saying, go to a planet and then return, although we are gonna be having an asteroid return mission coming up here very shortly. But uh, so it's, this is one reason why they have to make sure these samples can stay on Perseverance for a long time, because it could take 15 years before we have the technology and the funding for that matter to send the mission right. there to go retrieve those samples. But it, it, But it's also, because we hope to have humans go to Mars, we also, by doing a sample return like this, would be able to test out a robot landing and then lifting off on Mars to come back to Earth, which is gonna to have to happen, obviously, for a human mission as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so I, I guess the answer to that question is we're working on it. We're, we're, yeah. we're still not sure yet, but, uh, uh, but as soon as we figure it out, we'll let you know. Um, Let's see, so, so how about we take two more questions. Um, one question that I'm seeing now is how many constellations are there? Uh, so astronomers recognize 88 constellations in total. Um, but again, every, every culture that's ever existed has had their own set of constellations. But today, modern astronomers all over the world recognize 88 of them. And then the last question we have is, uh, I think the question, Mike, that we get the most often, and that question is, what in the world happened to Pluto? <laughs> so why, so, so, so why, so, so Declan asked, why did Pluto uh, 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 unbecome a planet, right? Why did we change to calling it a dwarf planet? Which is a great question. It's a, it's, it's a question with an answer of discovery, right? So when we found Pluto, um, we didn't know that much about what else was out there in the solar system. But in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s, we started to find more and more and more stuff in the solar system. We found uh, a big collection of little rocks and ice called the Kuiper Belt. That's where Pluto lives, inside the Kuiper Belt. We also found a number of other uh, objects that are about the same size as Pluto, that have a lot in common with Pluto. Um, the dwarf planets that we see today, right, which are uh, uh, Eris, Haumea, Makimaki, um, we discovered these. So scientists were, were left with a decision to make, which was, do we keep Pluto as a planet? If we do that, then we need to name all of these other things as planets too. And today we could have as many as 50 or 100 planets that we recognize as planets. That's how many things would have fit under our old definition. Or we change the definition of what a planet is, so we only have eight instead of 100. Um, so that's what we decided. We decided to make a new definition of a planet that Pluto just so happened to not meet, unfortunately. So Pluto didn't change, Pluto's still there, 
We just learned more about the solar system and we made a new definition of a planet. So right now, to be a planet, you need to do three things, right? You need to be a sphere, which Pluto is. You need to orbit the sun, which Pluto does. And finally, you need to be the only big thing in your path. Pluto, unfortunately, is not the only big thing in its path, thanks to things in the Kuiper Belt, thanks to these other dwarf planets. So it just didn't quite meet the definition, unfortunately. Our definition, though, could change in the future, right? We're, as we learn more, right, maybe we'll decide on a new definition of a planet. We don't know, right? We have no idea. So it's a really cool story because it all came about because we learned more about the universe, right? We learned more. So we change how we think about things. Humans do that all the time, right? We do that all the time in science. The uh, decision to reclassify Pluto was made by the International Astronomical Union in 2006, which is the only organization that has the authority to name things in the sky. They were also, the, in their very first meeting in 1922, the organization that decided on the official 88 constellations that we now use as our sky reference. So that was what they did in 1922 was to agree upon these constellations. And then in 2006, they decided to reclassify Pluto. Yeah, so, so what's important to keep in mind though, is that Pluto hasn't changed, right? Pluto's still the same wonderful, fascinating place that it's always been. We just now call it something else, right? We, we just call it a dwarf planet now. So Pluto is still a fascinating place, right? So, and we still are learning more about it. We sent a spacecraft that flew by Pluto back in 2015. Um, we're still learning from that spacecraft new things about Pluto still, even though it was over five years ago. That's been a long time. I'm getting old. I, I was in college when New Horizons flew by Pluto. Uh, but, um, but yeah, uh, so I think that is all of, uh, it's all the time that we have uh, for this evening. So uh, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today um, and, and, uh, and to thank the Fort Lee Library for, uh, for, for having us. Um, you all asked some wonderful questions. Um, which always makes uh, my job and Mike's job a whole lot more fun. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. So Mike, I, I don't know if you want to say uh, anything before we uh, wrap things up. Yeah, one more thing to mention is that if you go to Liberty Science Center's homepage and you go to LSC in the house, so all the shows that Andrew and I and our associate Krista have done for online planetarium shows are all available there as recordings and we've done a whole show about Pluto and why it got reclassified. So almost anything that you're into in terms of astronomy, we've done a show and have it there at our homepage. Just go to Liberty Science Center's homepage and then go to LSC in the house and we have 30 or so planetarium shows that we've done on topics like do aliens exist and also why was Pluto reclassified. All right, uh, Jessica, anything before we wrap our program up? Nope, I think that's it. Thanks so much, guys. Great. Thank you so much for having us, everybody. And one hopes you can get out there and see Mars over these next few nights. Yes. All right. Yes. Sounds okay. good. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye, all. Right. all. Have a great night. Bye. So long.